Amidst a long day of traveling, Jesus turns to his disciples and asks, Who do you say that I am? Jesus is in the heyday of his ministry. In the chapter leading up to this passage, he has been feeding thousands of people, healing people left and right, and teaching his disciples with every word and action. And now he and his entourage are headed on foot to Caesarea Philippi. And as they walk, he asks the disciples who the people say he is. And for that matter, who do his disciples say he is? Now, maybe Jesus is taking a moment to evaluate whether his ministry is having the desired effect on the people he meets. Or maybe he's trying to figure out how ready the disciples are to continue on without him. We can imagine a long silence just after Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? It's like when the teacher says, everybody put away your books. This is a pop quiz. I kind of know the answer to this, but my mind just went blank. What if I give the wrong answer? Is there a right answer? If I pretend that I'm vegetation, will I be invisible? Peter, never one to hesitate, follows his instincts. Just like when he jumped out of the boat and walked on water momentarily to meet Jesus. Maybe he's going with his gut. Maybe he wants to reassure Jesus. Maybe he's been thinking about how to explain who Jesus is for weeks. Whatever the case, he jumps right in. You are the Messiah. There. It's out. Messiah, or Christ, means anointed one. The Messiah is the long-awaited Savior of Israel, the one who will be anointed king by God. And according to Jewish teaching, this Messiah will restore God's holy and chosen people to their place of favor in the world. So for Peter to call Jesus the Messiah is huge. And with Peter's proclamation, two things happen. Peter, and by their silent assent, the other disciples, openly acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. Having traveled and watched and learned with him, they have witnessed healings and miracles that could only be done by someone with power granted by God. And second, Jesus begins to talk openly about what will happen to the Messiah. And for the first time in Mark, he gives details about his arrest, trial, execution, and resurrection. And so when Jesus starts talking about the discrimination and hate and violence that will lead to his death, Peter is understandably upset. And when Peter challenges Jesus, Jesus in turn acknowledges the temptation of fear. The word Satan means tempter. Fear tempts us. Fear holds us back from trusting one another and from trusting God. And Jesus goes on to tell the entire gathered crowd how to follow him, how to be disciples of the living God. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Following Jesus means letting go of that fear that tempts and defines us and taking up the cross of love as the guiding principle 
of all of our life. Letting go of our fear, of uncertainty, of losing ourselves and our accomplishments, of not getting enough love, forgiveness, recognition, and instead choosing to pick up the weighty lens of God's love to view ourselves, every person, and all creation. In yesterday's sermon at the Bishop Consecration, the preacher quoted Bishop Barbara Clementine Harris as saying, a cross is a burden you voluntarily pick up on behalf of another for the love of Jesus Christ. And she told us that Bishop Harris then went on to say, a cross is something we can put down any time. It is not something we are born with, nor is it a weight someone else puts on us that we cannot escape. We choose to pick up our cross because we know Jesus and because we want to proclaim his love with our actions. We each choose a different cross because our different life experiences and the wisdom we have from them inform the way that we know Jesus and his healing, welcoming, forgiving love. And sometimes the burden we carry for the sake of that love, our cross, changes because we, how we understand the importance of our faithful action in the world changes. To free our hands, our spirits, our bodies to pick up whatever our cross is. We must lay down the tempter's fear, doubt, and manipulation. Finding our own words to proclaim Jesus' love and how it changes our lives strengthens us to make that spiritual deep knee bend that we need to lift our cross. It's hard to explain Jesus in words that make sense in our everyday lives. Lives which are for many of us filled with practical things like grocery lists and social media posts rather than theological ideas and words. It takes Peter-like courage to name our deepest convictions about Jesus and how our faith in God changes our lives. So here's a way to think about it. How would you describe Jesus to someone who'd never heard about him before? To a child or a friend or a stranger? Now, I've had a little time to think about this. So here's my try. And it's a little longer than 30 seconds. Jesus is God's way of showing us how deeply God loves us, all people, and all creation. And Jesus reveals God's heart to us. God's heart aches with all who suffer, with depression and addiction, abuse and bullying. God's heart is upset and angry when human beings fail to recognize the reflection of the holy in one another and instead resort to violence. God's heart is torn up in grief at the suffering of thousands, millions of people who fear for their lives and homes because of war and famine and natural disasters. And that very same heart loves us like an adoring parent, wanting the very best for us and always eager to embrace us 
with grace and forgiveness and love, no matter what we've done or said or how far away we went. And God's heart loves every person and all of creation, whether they believe in God or Jesus or not. I think Jesus came to show us what's possible when we surrender ourselves to God's love. Rather than give in to the threat of disease, Jesus healed. Rather than surrender people to demons, Jesus showed compassion. Rather than let people starve because there wasn't enough to go around, Jesus fed everyone who was hungry. Knowing the infinite power of love, Jesus refused to be satisfied or limited by the status quo and invites us to do the same. If Jesus' life and death show us how much God loves us, then Jesus' resurrection shows us that love is more powerful than hate or fear or even death. So taking up my cross means loving God's people, even when it's hard and I do it imperfectly. Taking up my cross means putting God's vision of justice for people and creation above my own desires. It means sacrificing my ego-driven goals to pay attention to God's slow and steady revelation of God's self in the world and community around me. Like I said, I've had a little time to think about it. But we don't have to take, it doesn't have to be a long explanation. Peter proclaimed his faith in just four words. It isn't a test. There's no wrong answer. And the first answer we give doesn't have to be our only or final answer. We simply need to be sure we can answer authentically for ourselves. Jesus doesn't ask us to confess who he is for his sake. He asks us for ours, that we might be caught up in, transformed, and filled with courage by the power of his love and life. Who do you say Jesus is?